Uh, we're, uh, we're pretty innovative and we want to solve problems. We want to try new things. But if you don't really know how to approach those problems, then you're going to fumble a little bit more. It's going to take you longer. You're going to have more missteps. And even with an innovation fellowship, that's still going to happen. But at least you can do it in a professional, slightly more systematic way, um, perhaps a little bit better. And I think that helps move solutions forward a little bit better. And to piggyback to, on everything that you're all saying is that I, there's a science that needs assessments, right? I mean, what is a good need? What And how do you do the research to come to that conclusion? I feel like if we don't have those fundamental skill sets, then someone else will pick a need for us, whether it's relevant or not, uh, and put us back. And so I totally agree with you guys, and I, I love that. Um, the next question, I, I would love for you guys to take your time answering. Don't feel rushed because our audience members really want to know. Uh, and our, to our audience members, please post any questions. You know, the, uh, our panelists will answer anything uh, yeah, within reason. But the question <laughs> is, why did you pick your specific fellowship? And this is either as a fellow or as someone who's running the fellowship. You know, there's so many factors like the program itself, the hospitals it's affiliated with, the geographic location. I mean, I'd love to hear that. I can start off. Um, so I, um, I'm at Cornell. I'm in New York City. Um, part of the pull for my fellowship, I did an administrative fellowship, was so that I could be in the city. And I was really keen on getting my MBA. Um, I think as I was moving through business school, I realized that what I was gravitating towards naturally and the projects I wanted to pursue were to bridge that academic medical center and industry divide. Um, mm -hmm. And I had the unique opportunity, I think, of like, of being in school in the same vicinity as Cornell Tech, um, the campus that's doing quite a lot of research on their own end with PhDs, with master's students. And there were, there were opportunities for me to be involved as a physician to help craft some of the projects and help advise some of the students um, who were putting together healthcare solutions. So I think I came out of my fellowship yearning for more of that. Um, and to be honest, I think when I had initially set out, I wasn't even quite aware that this is where my passion was and this is what I wanted to do. Um, so I had, so then, you know, my, my team at Cornell had approached me about putting together an innovation fellowship and they had this incredible vision. They had incredible partnerships already in place. Um, and that's kind of why I got behind that effort and was like, this is honestly what I would have crafted as my dream fellowship of having a chance to understand what it takes to launch a business, to understand the fit, right? To understand what a value proposition is when you're pitching something. And then to take that one step further and say, where are the synergies in industry? How do we find partners? And how do we bridge that divide between academia and industry sometimes? So mm -hmm. I kind of came about it in a roundabout way. Um, but I have to say, like, I think ultimately the fellowship that we created was, was an ideal situation, um, that I'm really lucky that I got to help be part of it and now see our fellows move through it. And as a small plug, if anybody's interested, reach out, we're interviewing, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's what, that's what I'd say. Perfect. I'll be plugging all of your programs, but I also <laughs> want to just, uh, yeah, before moving on, understand, so it seems like the multidisciplinary aspect of working with tech students was something that was really exciting for you. And I'm sure the caliber of the students was, was quite high. Can you also speak to the city? So I, I get the sense that New York City is really becoming a tech hub, right? And it's it's very impressive in terms of its its network and, and connections, if you can speak on those two points. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the city itself has a few accelerators. And I think there's, there's the there's a nice split between some very large healthcare VC groups and smaller boutique ones. And I think the smaller ones have are very open to partnerships. And so New York has now, I think, turned into a little bit of a breeding ground in that sense. Um, and then I also see a lot of, from just like the academic standpoint, between the business schools and the Cornell Tech programs um, and elsewhere like NYU and Columbia as well, students coming together saying that we want this space. We want to talk about what, what we can do. We want to build together. We want to use the skills that we're learning in this space and with like who, with who else than other learners, you know? Um, and so I think it ends up being a really great incubating ground in that sense as well. Thank you. Yeah. I can talk a little bit about uh, my fellowship experience um, and why I did that. So um, for me, I was very interested in 
working in the community. Um, and at first I thought, you know, I wanted to do something more on the administrative end um, and looked at the routes that sort of lead to, you know, large group leadership. And then quickly saw that, you know, that looks interesting and fulfilling, but I like to do more random cool stuff. Um, and with an innovation fellowship, uh, I could do more of that. With USCQ Care Solutions, uh, I was in their first class of innovation fellows, which was definitely, you know, uh, uh, a big unknown, but it allowed me just to craft the fellowship and do basically whatever I wanted to do. Um, so that was cool. Um, I got to do a lot of different things and have an impact on uh, start programs that reach thousands of doctors at hundreds of ERs. Um, so it felt like what I was doing was making an actual impact, and that was really cool. Um, plus, you get all the resources and the data of a big group. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, and then also, you know, uh, North Coast or Third Coast, uh, best coast I could stay in my uh, prized Midwest here. Uh, so the, like location, basically you can be anywhere for USACS, they're all across the country and I wanted to stay around here. So that was helpful for me. Uh, but really more than anything, it was the opportunity to do pretty much whatever I wanted, a lot of cool things and have a really big, meaningful impact with the work I was, uh, uh, the work I was doing. I love that. So it seems like the geographic uh, flexibility was an important part of your decision. And where did you end up staying and why? It seems like you could have gone. So to I'm in, uh, I work at Summa Health in Akron, uh, and I live in Cleveland. Uh, and that's relatively close to family and uh, near a giant body of fresh water. Um, so I'm prepared for the future water shortages. So, and that's where you work for your fellowship as well in the Midwest because of those. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> Very important. Well, I'll go next. Um, I have to, you know, as a former Midwesterner uh, myself, um, gotta gotta love the Great Lakes and the prep for the water. Or so, you know, I'm finding my real estate there too. Um, but speaking of that, um, I came I came to innovation in a very kind of securitous way. Like I didn't come into residency thinking, oh, this is what I was going to do. I think I came in as a very undifferentiated resident um, and went to a lunchtime talk that was talking about the future of AI and healthcare. And boy, was I hooked. Um, and so I really became interested in actually what like what it meant to innovate in that space. And then as I was starting to learn about kind of the building of these models, how are we predicting, how are we emulating decision-making, like clinical decision-making into a set of, and, into, and basically mathematically model that such that you can get it into a computer and make those decisions, you realize that, well, where does it go from there? It, you get the paper, the paper's published, we're all very excited, but now what? Um, and so I really, that, be, that was, one of the places where I really started from and wanted to gravitate towards as I started my innovation journey. And also while I was a resident, I did my MBA uh, and was getting intro introduced to the world of business. You know, I wasn't, I, I kind of, I was a straight through person. Um, and so when I got introduced, you know, being able to talk, the great thing about, I will, I know this is about innovations fellowships, but I'll add the plug about the, about MBA programs. The cool thing about it is you're no longer surrounded by healthcare people. You're surrounded by people from all sorts of industries and that mind meld is incredible. And so that also got me interested in, okay, what does it mean to work within medicine and start it and work with industry and what does that partnership really look like? And so that's how I ended up at the Stanford Innovation Fellowship um, because there was really two, two components that were really exciting to me. One was the Stanford Emergency Medicine Partnership Program that we have, um, which, is an, which is a fantastic program that we've been building and developing over the past several years where we're working with taking advantage of where we are. We're sitting here in Silicon Valley. We're sitting here with kind of a lot of thought leaders who are looking to build innovation, but they're doing it within an industry context. But how do you make that bridge between a company that's building something, needing to validate, ensure the safety and reliability of what they're doing it, and actually getting it to the patients? There's a bit of a disconnect, and it's not a very necessarily smooth process. And so how can we build those partnerships to really actually push the envelope of innovation? And then secondly was Stanford itself. Um, and so I, like I said, I was coming at it more from an AI style perspective. Um, and so really wanted to get the technical expertise. Um, and so have been working with the uh, Department of Biomedical Data Sciences um, 
having um, getting a master's within that program, working a lot with computer science um, to actually learn the techniques that it takes to be able to be a part of that conversation. And then the projects that I've been focusing on has actually been around, actually Dr. Yudam had spoken about it in one of the earlier sessions, which is the STEMI work that we're doing. And how do we actually take that from desktop to bedside in a rigorous manner such that we know that what we're plugging in is actually going to be delivering the care that we want it to be delivering. Um, and so, and that whole framework, I think, is coming from a research perspective, but then also the biodesign framework. I think Stanford Biodesign is kind of a thought leader in how we can innovate um, within within medicine. Um, and so, being able to be a part of that, participating alongside you, Andy, and the faculty fellowship to build out those experiences has really been incredible and an important part of my fellowship and learning what it means to find the need, what it means to build the solution, what it means to take that need and that solution and drive it forward into something that can be used by our patients and our healthcare workers. Absolutely. I love all of your points. And, and just also because we have you know, audience members who probably are seriously contemplating a, a fellowship. If, if we can go into the, the details, so is it a one-year fellowship, two-year fellowship? I know the answers, but just for our audience members, and what was the rationale for that? Also, are there extra degrees that you can get or other, you know, institutions or partners that you can uh, really benefit from that is a, a major sell for your fellowship, among many others? I can start with that one. So um, two years. Easy enough. <laughs> Just well, we friends, right? We can, you know, you have so many more friends. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yeah, so you do it for two years, so you can build better friendships. Um, but all, <laughs> but all to say, um, for for us, um, a two year fellowship, I really think gave us the, gave me the opportunity to actually take advantage of specifically all the things that Stanford had to offer. Um, and so that was including getting a master's. So I did my master's in biomedical data sciences. I think a lot um, of our fellows look actually at doing their MBA um, as well. Um, and so I, like I said, looking for that kind of technical expertise and also getting involved in another department. And then um, being able to do it over two years gave me the, it, it, it takes a minute to get, I think, your footing, especially if you're new in this space. And so you spend, you know, the first part learning and then you start doing and then it becomes it's it's over. So I think having that second year really allowed for some longitudinal um, aspects to the projects, being able to kind of build a little bit more portfolio and also allowed me to do the Stanford Biodesign program as well. And just to add to that, only because I know what the program, I know that other fellows have gone in an MBA at Hopkins and also uh, yes. Berkeley Law. So a lot of flexibility in what you want to do. Uh, I can hop in. So I think um, for Cornell's Innovation Fellowship, the big highlight is being a part of the Cornell Tech Runway Program. Um, and that's been present there for I think, several years. And they've spun out, I think, over 100 companies. Um, the program itself is composed of PhD students and master's students, and what we were able to do is essentially secure a spot for our fellow to be a part of it too, um, and work with all these all these amazing individuals who have their own IP, own ideas, and let the fellow serve as a, like a consultant. You know, unofficial capacities these are very early stage. But the fellow undergoes the same didactic teaching that the rest of these students are undergoing through the Broadway program um, on Cornell Tech's campus. And we've structured the fellowship to give the, give the fellow a very immersive first few months with this program. So the idea is we know that you can practice medicine in the ED. Now let's put you in this space and just think wild, you know, learn as much as you can, build out as many networks as you can, be creative and and come back ready to both bring some of those skills and ideas to the ED and also continue working with those uh, teams post the runway program. So whichever ones you know you're kind of working with that you end up finding a lot of success with, synergy with, post runway program if you're if they're going into seed round funding, if they're, you know, if they're really building this out and they want you on their team, that's an option. So I think that's kind of the big I think, highlight. Um, there's a bunch of certifications and programs and courses that you can enroll in through Cornell, um, but not, not a specific degree, but we're, we've been pretty flexible and able to work around whatever fellows kind of desire. And to be honest, that's the trend that I've been seeing in a lot of fellowships. 
where things are pitched one way and then someone comes in and says, you know, I have a great idea. I'd like to structure it like this. What do you think? So I think, you know, for anyone out there who's thinking and trying to ponder, put together pieces of a fellowship, talk to the directors, talk to people who are running the programs, because more often than not, if your interests align, if they think you're a good fit, we they can make it work. Um, for USCCS's Innovation Fellowship, it's just one year. Uh, it's a really fast year. Um, you really hit the ground running. Um, but I thought it was uh, adequate to really get programs started. And then if you stick with the company uh, afterwards at you know any one of their sites, you can keep working on all their programs or whatever you started working on, which is what I did. Um, I came into it with an MBA. Not of all of the USACS Innovation Fellows have had an MBA going into it. I think that required. Um, you get a pretty large academic uh, or educational stipend during the fellowship that you can apply to pretty much any um, reasonably academic thing that you want to do. Um, conference, training programs, if you're interested, you know, getting a master's in health policy or an MBA or whatever, you can put it toward that. So that's super flexible. Um, and you can take the time to do that. There's a pretty low like or, uh, clinical requirement. Um, and then there's no like formal academic partnerships since, you know, obviously USACS is like a large physician group and not like directly affiliated with, uh, you know, like a university or anything. Um, but there is a loosely affiliated venture capital group called Transform Health Ventures that uh, I've gotten involved with through USACS that, you know, obviously prevents uh, or presents very cool opportunities. And we partner with ASAP with a lot of things. Um, one of the projects I was working on was implementation of an alternative payment model, the first government run one in coordination with Maryland ASAP. So we work with them uh, on a lot of cool things too. I love that. I think everything you guys are, are saying is so important. And I think building up to this highlight question right here is can you share with us something that either you or one of your fellows uh, have been working on as a project that's exciting? you know, that's impactful. And please take your time and I'll be asking some probing questions because I think the audience members will really be interested in this question. So hard just to choose one. Um, so like, you know, you, you work on all these things and they're all like, you know, babies in a way, I guess, to you. And, you know, they're all, they all just, it's so difficult to choose one. But one of the things that I was most proud of was working on an opioid reduction, uh, prescription reduction program. Um, and that was a program in which we basically just, got more directed feedback um, and created a dashboard uh, for peer comparison. So our, all of our like thousands of USACS docs could see their prescription uh, rates and compare it to their peers for opioids. Um, and then we implemented like a peer feedback program to get to the high uh, prescribing outliers. And that reduced opioid prescriptions like 15%, um, which I think had a, or could have had a pretty real impact um, actually affect patient lives. I mean, if you multiply that out over thousands of ER docs and you know, hundreds of sites, maybe that prevented a few, at least, um, patients developing opioid use disorder, you know, getting overdoses. So um, that makes me feel good about like an actual real world impact of something I did. Yeah, I love that, especially coming from Boston, where we had such a huge opioid you know, epidemic. I mean, it's such a meaningful innovation and it doesn't always have to be around AI, you know, some of, some of the best problems are the largest, lowest hanging fruit. So I, I love that. Um, I can hop on next. Um, and I'm sorry, I meant to say earlier that our fellowship is one year. Forgot to include that. Um, so uh, I think maybe one of the projects that I was very excited about. I came into Midway, which sometimes happens. Um, there was a really incredible effort uh, to use the Microsoft HoloLens um, to augment training for airway management. Um, so we have some incredible thought leaders at Cornell who had worked with um, some other PhDs at a lab and set up an interface for our students, our interns, to use the Microsoft HoloLens where there would be a live teacher virtually guiding them who could see what they were seeing. And I kind of helped, I came in at the point where this was all set up and we said, you know what, let's see if we can do an, a non-inferiority study with this. Is this non-inferior to a traditional you know, method of teaching airway management? Um, 
I, I know when I first heard about it, I was like, no way, like you need someone there and like, this isn't gonna work. They're not gonna see this. Um, and not only were the interns like super jazzed about, you know, using this heat cool device, but um, it, it ended up being truly non inferior. Um, and I think it just kind of set the set the stage for us to start thinking more about how we use um, augmented reality or VR for education. Um, and I had never considered that before. And the more we kind of think about it, the more you think about all these other areas in healthcare at large, there's a massive need to like train technicians, whether they're CT techs, you know, radiology technicians. And there's a lot of just learning that needs that typically happens in a classroom or or via zoom and now there's all these other thoughts spinning around like what if we use this kind of you know augmented reality to have the have the device kind of right there what if there was someone pointing to the different parts of a ct scanner being like this is what this does and this is what's going on here so um I, I was really, really fortunate, I think, to be brought in on that project and excited to see the results. And um, I'm working with this team to see where else we can use it, what else we can prove. Um, and I think the possibilities are endless. Um, and I think what's what's also cool is the technology itself is improving while we are thinking of other ways to use it. So it's almost this like parallel force. Um, and I think, you know, the next five years, I really do think it's going to change a lot of education, not just medical education for students or for medical students, but for training for healthcare, healthcare workers. Yeah, 100%. And, and it's not like the training stops with medical students and residents. I mean, if I could have VR augmented reality to practice a pacer wire over and over again, <laughs> yes. you know, that, that would be amazing. Uh, yeah, so that, that's a really exciting project. Yeah, did you see me? <laughs> I, I was just gonna say, I feel like that continuing education component of it is really is really exciting because then yeah. it can be anywhere. Like we don't all have to come into like one space. Like it just it's yeah. Disabled. And you know, I think we all would love the ability to sustain all of our skills, whether we're working with residents or not. And like, nope, still got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For the youngins, and, you know, and also some of us have children, and so we can have a baby in one arm and uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Always <laughs> of technology. That's a great project. <laughs> Wonderful. So I, I can go next. Um, so um, as I kind of alluded to, one of the major projects that I have been working on um, while um, while while as a fellow, and I'm actually continuing to work on because I'm not excited about it, um, is uh, work in our uh, STEMI screening um, space. So really being able to tackle the problem of getting people ECGs in a timely manner um, to be able to diagnose STEMI. And the work has really taken on three main categories, which is the idea of building a better model, which I think is a really exciting space in emergency medicine data sciences, um, because a lot of data science is really excited about, you know, all of the data and all of the time to be able to compute with all of the data and being able to give you that, you know, sepsis prediction in six hours. But emergency medicine, we don't think that way. We have limited time, we have limited data. And so what are the ways in which we can optimize given the limitations of the care that we, with the um, space that we're in? And so that's kind of one area. Um, the second is making sure that we're doing it within an through an equity lens. Um, and a lot of interesting kind of techniques we've seen, not just in emergency medicine, but as um, predictive modeling and healthcare has been really moving forward, or there's a lot of different techniques and ways in which we can optimize for, for equity. And so kind of how can we push the boundaries on those methodologies to make it reliable and consistent, despite limitations in the data sets that we have. And then finally is really the translational aspect, kind of with a prototype that we've seen that performs better than humans, how do we start to make that transition from desktop to bedside? Um, and what I think is often in a misunderstood component of translating AI in healthcare is that it's just a plug and play. And what we've really found is that plugging and playing does not work and does not allow for the safety of our patients mm -hmm. um, in this in this specific in, in this specific realm of predictive modeling for patients. And so really think really a big focus of the work that I did over the past couple of years was thinking about what are the methods in which we start making that translation happen. So it becomes not only a technical component of what it means to take the tech into that space, what makes it disseminable, what may allows us to actually monitor, shift, drift, you know, what are we going to be doing with the model in order to be able to make it sustainable in the long run, but then also 
How are we iterating over it? How are we looking at the safety, the functionality of it? You know, how are we looking at it from a workflow perspective, right? Anchoring on not the technology itself, that the AI is not the technology by itself, but really how it functions within the entire workflow and as actually a part of it. It's not just it's not just some one singular thing, but we're thinking about the entirety of that process. And so that overarching theme coming into it's not AI plug and play, it's a workflow that we're really trying to augment and to be able to improve the decision-making of the humans that we have and how do we go about that in a scientifically rigorous way. Um, and so current, you know, continuing, continuing to work on those methodologies and really excited by the results that we're seeing. And I think STEMI is a, the prototype disease that I've been working on and that our team has been working on, but I think is applicable to other diseases and to other spaces at, that are looking to make those translations happen. Yeah, and I love that you talked about equity, right? This is something that John Halamka mentioned in the keynote is all data is biased. I, I, we understand that, but how do you mitigate that? And right. how do you think about the underrepresented populations historically, you know, unrepresented and not involved in a lot of the technological advancement, advancements? How right. do you continue to have them as a center of our care along with all our other patients? So I love that piece. Yeah. Um, other questions, we have a, a audience member question here that I would love to have you guys answer. What skills do innovation directors look for in physicians applying for these fellowships? I'm going to go a step further and say, what is what type of fellow are you looking for? You know, are your fellows someone that comes straight out of residency, or are they actually mid-career or working in the community or academics? Like, is there a prototype, or you know, actually, do fellows come with all types of diverse stories? Thank you for the leading uh, answer uh, there, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> just spoon feed that one aspect. but it is a hundred percent true because i think you've seen it right you've seen it firsthand that it really does come in all um you know all varieties which i which is i think what's exciting about innovation is that innovation isn't necessarily something you have to do in a certain time period right it naturally makes sense for you to go from one place to the next and there and that's like the sequence with which it has to happen um, you know, our, and you know, our very first fellow, um, was somebody who was um, mid-career, um, and I think he'll be participating as a part of this, um, John Dayton, absolutely wonderful innovator, and I would say a leader within innovation and emergency medicine, um, participated in this fellow after he had already had experience, and I remember coming in thinking, I don't have the same experience as him. Oh my goodness, is this a problem? And it wasn't, right? I think it can't, you know, having those two components to it allow for, I think, a successful fellowship, being able to take on the people with experience and taking on those who don't. And I think those who don't should not be shy that they didn't get involved early, that they didn't work with the VC while they were in, you know, in medical school, that they didn't start six companies and build 12 different computers. Like that's okay. I think a, an understanding of what it means to be an innovator in like a philosophical sense, kind of the direction that you want to go within innovation. And frankly, I think that general innovation, je ne sais quoi, of like wanting to, wanting to build a better future for our emergency physicians and kind of hungry to learn what it takes from all the different facets of it is what makes a successful innovation fellow, but in all flavors, as you've already alluded to. I love that. And and just a quick point about John Dayton being remarkable. I remember hearing about his exploits, uh, having already been an entrepreneur and being involved in venture. And when I came here, I was like, better pack up my bags and go back to the East Coast because these, you know, these fellows are amazing. <laughs> um, I, I can hop in. Um, I think, I mean, Yes, we can, anybody from mid-career to one year out to just came out, right? Our current fellow is, has been out working in the community for a couple of years. I do, th there's advantages, I think, to both kind of approaches. When you're mid-career and you come in, you're not worried about kind of honing your skills at that very moment as an attending physician, right? Because, and you don't have to study for your board. So maybe you can take your time and use it a little differently. And we talked in the beginning of this about how the innovation fellowship is also just like an opportunity to start thinking and creating. And so if you think about it like that, this is you saying, you know how to be a physician and now you're ready to apply your skills and mind elsewhere. So I think that's, that's one approach. And then coming straight out, I mean, you're, you're ready to keep learning, you know, there's, there's no, like, there's no, uh, I guess, dissatisfaction in going back to being in a fellowship position. Um, 
And I think you come in with a certain energy right out of residency, like ready to keep building on what you've what you've been working on. So there's there's nothing there's no wrong answer there. I do think that, um, you know, piggybacking on what Gabrielle said in terms of understanding maybe what you're interested in. To me, that also means you have an understanding of what the healthcare landscape is. And I think if you're coming in saying that you want to do an innovation fellowship, eat, it, it'd be it'd be great if you understood a little bit about like what's happening outside your hospital and like what are the new challenges that are approaching what are the big regulations that are being passed right now or debated you know and how is that going to affect the the landscape in the next few years so I think having a general awareness of what's happening in healthcare in, in healthcare innovation um, both in in the space that you're at in the geographic location you're at and elsewhere. Um, demonstrates this like passion. And I think it then becomes easier for you to speak to what part really, really applies to you and what you want to bring to the table. Love that. Yeah, totally. I mean, don't really have too much to add to that. Um, but really just to echo what was already said, you know, at USACS, just looking for people um, with no particular background, but who are at baseline, very solid docs, um, like this is not an escape from clinical medicine. Like, you know, we're looking for people who are still like really good docs and still like want to work and actually see patients, because I think that is where we draw a lot of ideas and at least find problems uh, for me. And, you know, that influences what sort of projects you work on down the line. But, you know, just having a track record of showing that you're interested in working on problems, things some sort of track record or CV that shows that you want to be innovative, which probably makes sense uh, for an innovation fellowship. Um, but again, you don't need an MBA. You don't need a master's in anything. Uh, I came straight from residency. I did an MBA in med school, but you know, I had just done or tried to do sort of cool projects and make local changes at my single site ER. You know, hadn't you know created a tech uh, startup or anything like that. Um, hadn't created an AI model. You know, just tried to uh, make care a little bit better at the one ER I was at in residency, and that was enough to then work on national projects. Um, so just showing that you're interested and willing to uh, try new things and get out there and try to make an impact um, is mainly it. You know, you're you're gonna be networking and working with a lot of people. Um, so, you know, if, if you could show that, you know, you're a generally genial person, like to interact well with other people and get along well in the sandbox, I think that's really important. You know, the lone innovator isn't really as much of a thing. Um, it's a lot more difficult and it's more fun with friends. Um, so uh, we look for that at USACS. But otherwise, um, yeah, just somebody who's got somewhat of a track record of trying to make things a little bit better and shows energy and interest. Yeah. I'm glad you said that, John, because as you know, I was thinking earlier, a lot of what we were talking about was tech focused, mm -hmm. but I think especially as an applicant, innovation can be anything that you're doing to improve the space that you're in. I think my innovation work, so to speak, as a resident was we had gotten Epic, I think six months before I finished residency, and I said, you know what, no one's using Epic Chat, <laughs> so we need to figure out how to use Epic Chat and like message our CT text. So it's it's not it does not have to be anything like brand new. You don't need to build a you know a, pro a product or something, but it's using your tools maybe that are around you, resources, and thinking slightly differently about how to use them and maybe trying to leverage them to your advantage. I love that. Uh, I'm trying to. I'm going to be ambitious and try to squeeze in a couple more questions. But one is, um, why should actually? Let me pick this question because it's been interesting. So, how how did your fellowship, um, I guess, open doors potentially for leadership opportunities both inside and outside of healthcare? I'm just walking down a hallway of open doors, really. Um, so. The USACS fellowship is run by Jesse Pines, who's a fairly well-known uh, researcher who was in academia and then came to USACS and headed up our innovation department. And then, you know, obviously USA, USACS is a pretty large company with a lot of ERs, a big network. Um, I have met so many people who are doing really cool things, uh, both inside USACS and out. 
Um, I am a part of so many, too many different things now. It's it's hard to say. Um, you know, I'm helping uh, as a diligence committee member for a venture capital firm. Uh, I'm involved in a um, uh, the Emergency Medicine Innovation Collaborative, which uh, you know works on spreading sort of innovation resources to the community to sort of uh, non-academic areas. Um, I work with people who are in health policy. Uh, there's just like so much and I don't have time for enough time for all of them, but it's crazy having dedicated time and putting yourself into a place where you're going to build a network just opens up all the doors to so much that you want to do and being an innovation fellow and labeling yourself as somebody who is sort of an innovative thinker. Um, people are very attracted to that and want to work with you. Yeah, I think I, I actually want to piggyback off something, John, you said in your previous answer, um, which is the true teamwork aspect of this, um, right? No, because I think it was just wonderful what you said. You can't innovate by yourself. I mean, maybe you can, but then you're an innovation of one and I hope it makes your life better, but I don't know how it's going to get out. Um, and really the team aspect of innovation, developing, identifying who you need on your team, what makes a successful team, and building those leadership skills for that team management, I think is an important part of an innovation fellowship. Um, and I think that really opened, and having those skill sets, those soft skills um, that I think everybody is working towards over their career, but in a kind of more dedicated use case, um, are really sought after and allows you and pre really prepares you to take on those projects that, as I think also was previously discussed, don't have to be in tech, but can be even just within your healthcare system, can be within an innovation education. I think that's been an exciting thing that we've been working on in our fellowship is, you know, some of the work that um, Dr. Kabir has been doing with innovation education, like those leadership skills and leading a lot of those efforts is, is I think, something that really prepares you for the leadership that comes outside and that people are kind of seeking out your expertise in that space to lead the teams that are going to be pushing forward the next innovation. Yeah, um, you know, I'll take it from there a little bit further in, in terms of maybe thinking about it as hard and soft skills with being a leader. Um, I think when you do an innovation fellowship, when you're in that team-based setting and trying to execute on a project, you understand project management skills. Um, and there has to be like a skill set there that 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 can be used with everybody. I think I think a lot back to working on projects with my co-residents versus working on projects with um, students with in my MBA program versus working on projects now. And I think it's very different working with a group of people who did not spend the last three years doing the exact same thing that you were doing. So I think there's there's something to be said about learning that universal project management speak. Um, and then with that, you know, the soft skills of being a leader, um, understanding how to be a little um, or having developing your EQ, um, understanding how to run a meeting, uh, how to understanding how to support different team members. Um, and I think in terms of the opportunities, it comes with it. So I we talked, all of us have talked about like the network that you develop and the context that you develop. And I think that's how you, that's how additional doors open. Um, I can speak a little bit maybe to like being in academia. I think doing um, a fellowship in like an academic institution there, you have access to meeting with senior hospital level, level leaders. And so you might be working maybe on a department level, working on some innovation. I think it's really cool as a fellow to be able to be like, hey, you know, to the for for us, it's, it'd be New York Presbyterian. So it's like the leaders up there. What are you thinking about for the hospital system? How are you approaching these discussions on whether or not we should bring in AI in this respect or that respect? So I think there's a lot of opportunities there, and then those can transform into further like leadership opportunities, job opportunities, whatever it may be. And just to piggyback on that, Sumia, is this idea of you have multidisciplinary teams. You know, I've learned, maybe you guys would disagree that my friends were software engineers or, you know, business executives or UI, UX, RC designers may not always think the same. And so how do you navigate, you know, each each other's priorities and, and needs in a, in a very healthy, uh, high EQ way? So I love that piece. I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions. Uh, and the last question is going to be a lot of fun. So brace yourself. But the first, the first part of that is, you know, why should residents pursue an innovation fellowship over maybe more traditional ones like a clinical informatics fellowship. And I know some of you touched on the uh, more administration within infra, uh, innovation focused type of fellowship, but 
right, let's focus on clinical informatics. Like what is the differentiating factor just for audience members? Aside from the board that they have to write? <laughs> no, kidding. That alone <laughs> would <persuade> me. <laughs> Although who knows, maybe innovation. I should have sold you on that one. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next question. Moving on, next question. <laughs> um, I, I'm happy to kind of jump jump in a little bit. Is you know, I think um, I think innovation, kind of what I alluded to earlier, is innovation is really broad. Um, and clinical informatics is not necessarily as broad. Um, and so an innovation fellowship really gets you exposed to all types of innovation not just a little on more of the kind of informatics data side of things though i think being able to speak that language and understand it is is really important as well and is and is often a part of an innovation fellowship but not to the same depth necessarily as a clinical informatics fellowship um and i think again looking at more of a innovation as more of a d idea life cycle right understanding the need you're not tasked with anything you're understanding your need you're building your solutions and you're looking at the sustainability of those solutions and using and really using a much bigger toolbox right not everything has to be ai enabled ai might actually be the absolute wrong solution for this it might it might not be the thing you need to be doing and so as you build out the your innovation toolbox you get back into your kind of need and understanding the clinical problem. And I think an innovation fellowship is able to give you kind of that broader range of educational experiences. Yeah. I think you said it all, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think an innovation fellow and someone who's innovating will always have need and work with an informaticist. Yeah. Um, and I think informaticists often are um, they innovate in that own in their in that space as well, but just like you were saying, it's in that space. And I think innovators are thinking four levels above, and also saying, can we expand this way, that way? Can we grow this partner here? Um, does this have to be contained to this platform? Can we go elsewhere? Um, and so I just think there's slightly a few more maybe guardrails um, with the clinical informatics space um, that innovation seeks to break, not to knock it. I love that. Absolutely. And then now the last question, all the questions were fun, but this is going to be in honor of our pitching competition. But you guys, please spend two minutes pitching your fellowship to our attendees here. And also anyone else will record it. So anyone can start. You get two minutes and I'll time you guys. Tell us why should we join your fellowship? I can go first. All right. So you should join the U.S. Acute Care Solutions Innovation Fellowship. This is an opportunity to have a national impact with your innovative ideas. And in the meantime, to build skills that you can take either or keep in the company to keep working on projects that will have a national effect or to apply to a number of uh, other areas whatever your, uh, your interests are, if you want to do research, health policy, um, entrepreneurship, uh, really anything that your innovative niche is, you can do it at our fellowship with uh, a high degree of freedom pretty much anywhere in the country and with uh, a lot of support from a big national organization. Well said, John. I love that. I can go next. Um, all right. Well, you should do your innovation fellowship at Cornell. Um, <laughs> and for me, I think there's four main reasons. Um, one, you've got the Cornell brand. There's Cornell, Wild Cornell Medicine and Cornell Tech. So there's just baseline, so many resources that are one email or one referral away. Um, two, you've got the runway program. So it's it's a guaranteed like four month immersive opportunity for you to just spend time learning everything there is about bringing a company from ideation to the to the market, to bring the product to life. Um, and the best part is it's okay if you don't have an idea because there's other people there who do and they need your help. Um, let's see. And then I'd also say, I think our, the department, our ED department um, at Cornell, I think it excels in operations and therefore makes a lot of space for innovation. So if you have an idea, we have the infrastructure for you to help to implement it. Um, and then lastly, I'm in New York City. Like it doesn't get this much better. I've got Broadway right over there. I've got every like type of ramen I want to eat like right around me. Um, 
and there's three airports nearby, so I can go wherever I want. Puerto Rico is like three hours away. Outstanding pitch. When you said ramen, my stomach gurgled. <laughs> so hungry. I'm telling you, always. <laughs> Every, any time of year for me. <laughs> yeah, New York City uh, food scene is unparalleled for sure. Oh, yeah. well, these are some tough acts to follow, and I might not have Broadway, but I'll say I have sunshine. Um, and so, um, so to go ahead, um, so for the Stanford Emergency Medicine Innovation Fellowship, um, it really gives you an opportunity to innovate and learn where it all started. You're at the center of Silicon Valley, and you're at an institution that I think really thrives and defines what innovation is all about. That really has seeped into our own department. And so the Department of Emergency Medicine here lives and breathes innovation. We have people who are focused on innovation, but even those who are not necessarily directly related to our innovation group are working through innovation and really bringing it forward, whether or not it's in their research efforts or their education efforts. Um, and so it's really a part of the identity of Stanford Emergency Medicine. At the same time, you're getting linked into Stanford University, which is a natural hub for a lot of innovation, whether or not it's Stanford Biodesign or even within the main campus itself, it is right there um, and really brings on several ideas that really start to make you take outside of medicine, right? Instead of innovating only within that medicine space, can you take techniques, ideas, and fresh looks from the people who are at Stanford University and really being able to push your innovation forward? And finally, it's the connection between Stanford as well as the entire ecosystem around Silicon Valley. Not only is it the, the startup energy that is here, but it's also the other accelerators and the other institutions that are working to push forward innovation, right? We're working with people like Fogarty uh, Innovations, um, which is just down the street for us in collaborations to really continue to build our ecosystem that goes outside of just emergency medicine. You know, wow to all of you. I, I got to say for our pitch competition, we can only pick one winner, but this is, you know, as a moderator, you guys are all winners. So I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, Gabrielle with Stanford, John with US ACS, and Somia with Cornell. I mean, these are all amazing, amazing, life-changing innovation fellowships. Uh, and I want to say that speaking to you guys, it's very clear that an innovation fellowship isn't just optional. I mean, it's almost essential now. If you want to be a leader in the cutting edge, in the forefront of our field, you have to understand how to innovate. And so 100% agree with you all. And so for audience members, this is not it. We still have our very, very famous Pitchem competition coming up. So I just want to say we have three incredible founders pitching their startup ideas to our team judges. So we'll see you there. Thank you, guys. Thank you.